This is our February colloquium. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Amazy. I'm the director of the Communication Research Center and an associate dean of research at the college. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. First, could you please be sure to silence your phones, your tablets, your laptops, so that we don't distract those around you and interfere with the recording equipment. We are recording this event. If you are a student wishing to earn SONA credit, please be sure that you have checked in at the back desk there uh, with our staff and uh, show your BU ID. And speaking of our staff, I would like to thank our lab and research manager, Amanda King, as well as Alyssa Hans, who's in the back, uh, for all their help in making this uh, colloquium series happen. Our colloquium speaker today is Dr. James E. Katz, who is the Feld Professor of Emerging Media Studies. He was the inaugural director of our Division of Emerging Media Studies, and he's a prolific researcher. According to Google Scholar, his works have been cited more than 18,000 times. His current research examines the melding of mobile communication technology and artificial intelli intelligence, and what this will mean for society. His pioneering publications on AI and society, social media, mobile communication, and robot-human interaction have been internationally recognized and translated into a dozen languages. Dr. Katz's two most recent books are Perceiving the Future Through New Communication Technologies, Robots, AI, and Everyday Life, as well as Nudging Choices Through Media, Ethical and Philosophical Implications for Humanity, both of which were co-edited by Juliet Floyd and Katie Shepherds. In 2021, he received the prestigious Frederick Williams Prize for contributions to the study of communication technology by the International Communication Association, where he, is also, he has also achieved fellow status, a recognition of distinguished scholarly contributions to the broad field of communication bestowed upon less than 5% of ICA members. Prior to his 2012 appointment here at BU, he was Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of Communication at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Beyond academia, he was a distinguished member of staff at Bell Communications Research early in his career. Today, Dr. Katz will be drawing upon his years of research in his talk, The Tangled Triangle, AI, Education, and Democracy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James E. Katz. Thank you very much, Professor Amazine, for that nice introduction. And I want to say how much I appreciate everybody coming out to hear my thoughts today. I hope we'll have an opportunity to exchange ideas at the end of my comments. Uh, I know there's a lot going on in each of your lives, so it's particularly meaningful that you're taking time to come out and hear my ideas. Hopefully you'll get credit either in the afterlife or maybe this semester for your efforts today as well. Uh, as Professor Amazine pointed out, I'm really going to be looking at AI, education, and democracy. My approach will be uh, with broad brushstrokes, so we'll hopefully have an opportunity to look in a little more depth when we get over the main points. But let me begin by giving you uh, kind of a big picture of uh, what I hope to do. So I want to first talk a little bit about democracy, uh, look at some of the worries that people have had about precursors to artificial intelligence, as well as AI today, as a backdrop so that we can anchor our current concerns then look at where AI is heading in the educational frontier and what some of the changes mean for democracy. And finally, look at what steps might be able to be taken to moderate some of the negative effects of artificial intelligence while helping the fruits of this technology to be of greater social benefit. 
And if we have time, uh, I want to make some comments about my time this past year on sabbatical leave at Cambridge University, which is often confused with Oxford University. And, uh, you know, we call ourselves Yanks if we're from New England or north of the Mason-Dixon line, or even as Americans. Well, there was a movie called A Yank at Oxford, but I was a Yank at Cambridge. Uh, I think that's a fair likeness, don't you? <laughs> well, uh, pretty close. You know, all this deep fakes and things, you could mistake that for me. Well, uh, let's begin by taking a look at governmental structures for democracy. And here we have um, distinctions between what might be considered pure democracy, where people directly register their viewpoints through voting or through town halls, and the political leaders must be responsive to those viewpoints of the citizenry to representative democracy, where uh, we call that the Republican form of government, not necessarily Republican Party, uh, to more consultative methods, and I think technocracies uh, probably is a pretty good description of our situation here, or maybe even presidential, where uh, the decisions are made by experts or bureaucrats and are strongly governed by leadership, which is only periodically responsive to the will of the public. And then we have other kinds, oligarchical, where the small group of elites run things without much input, but occasional input from the public. Autocratic, largely uh, a group of leaders who don't tolerate dissent, but they don't really care what the people do too much beyond not interfering with the operations of the government. And finally, the totalitarian model, where there is an ideology viewpoint which the political leaders enforce on the public. So we have quite a spectrum here, and it's of great interest, I think, to all of us about the way artificial intelligence will be affecting democratic processes, oligarchical processes, and authoritarian and totalitarian processes. But where do the viewpoints of the people come from? And I will argue today that they grow up through the educational system, not entirely, but powerfully. And so today, I want to look at how AI will be affecting the educational system. Do any of you recognize this photograph, by the way? Mean anything to you? Anybody familiar with this, what it might say? Yes. I can read the and I know the city. Yes, uh, you know Chengdu? Yeah. Okay. I'm not from there, but I uh -huh. Okay. Uh, is that a sign that's fairly typical that you might encounter in China? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. um, what is, what's on that sign? What are the viewpoints? What are the values expressed on that sign, by the way? traditional values and respect for the government, things like that, yeah. So, uh, of course, every government, I think, has representations of the values of the government, and this, of course, as many of you know, is from, uh, from People's Republic of China. Uh, so, uh, I put that up there to, to indicate that the governments, including our own government, have in the U.S. government have a set of values that they propagate through the educational system in China, respectively, and in the United States uh, that they want the citizenry to be responsive to. So we also have to be sensitive to the fact that we can have what appears to be a democracy but may not necessarily be a democracy, and that artificial intelligence can be very significant in creating the impression of democracy, but also in suppressing forces that might lead to democracy. So what are the qualities?
qualities that would separate a passive or controlled citizenry from a democratic citizenry. Well, I submit uh, these are some of the points that would allow a citizenry to be effectively democratic. And I'll just run through them because I want to revisit them at the end of my talk to see how AI might be affecting. So, knowledgeable and critical thinkers, a sense of civic commitment, uh, tolerant and respectful are useful but not essential. And why are these important? Well, uh, first of all, we have the utilitarian argument. People will have better lives in terms of the material conditions. Uh, they'll have better social interaction through social cohesion. And finally, there will be better protection for both individual liberty and personal freedoms important values. So uh, now turning our attention to AI and historical concerns about AI, I'm going to juxtapose historical concerns with contemporary concerns. Now of course there were not artificial intelligence technologies per se uh, 50 or 100 years ago, but there were facsimiles to them. So here for example we can see uh, concerns about how te uh, technology, in this case mechanistic technology, would control workers there on your right or control productive workers here on your left. Well, uh, that's of course Charlie Chaplin in his dystopian movie, Modern Times. Uh, but then we have people like this motor delivery guy and he's not too different in some sense than these people here being driven moment by moment reporting where, where are you doing, how productive are you. And this represents a bit of a threat to worker autonomy and individual choice in the workplace. So we can also uh, think about mechanistic concerns about uh, creative arts. So here uh, the union that wanted live performers in New York and elsewhere were concerned about uh, the Victrola and other recorded music destroying the livelihood and uh, likewise here is a kind of a gender depiction of the imposition of mechanical music with real humans. Uh, and we see these concerns echoed in the recent Hollywood writer strike where there was a lot of criticism over the possibility of AI taking the jobs of creative writers. And we have uh, Sean Penn, among other people, uh, complaining about this, saying it's an abomination. And here, in, this was uh, in the 1930s, looking forward to the 1950s when robots would be uh, in people's houses. Well, of course, we know this has not yet materialized, but uh, there are concerns about romantic relationships growing up between robots or uh, replicants and human beings. And uh, finally, there's concern about uh, even physical attacks of, in this case, robots on people. And we see that echoed about uh, war in the Ukraine, where it's even been claimed that there have been autonomous uh, drones that have through artificial intelligence, recognize the faces of um, purported Russian officers and have been independently allowed to attack when it matches up that face that it detects with a profile. And it's been claimed that these ro robot drones have actually autonomously killed humans. Uh, it's more likely, though, that humans attack these machines, as you see here, a worker kicking another uh, home delivery robot um, uh, off into the junk. And here you find a, a woman uh, in China attacking a, a friendly greeting receptionist robot. But as I say, there's long-standing concerns about robots attacking people, killing people in a warfare environment. And ultimately, 
what we hear about concerns about artificial intelligence is that uh, it may destroy mankind or at the very least make mankind superfluous so it has no purpose anymore and uh, I just picked this up off the internet earlier today I think this is a day or two old about uh, artificial intelligence supposedly demanding the users worship the uh, AI entity. And of course it's not exactly unique to, uh, to today. This is uh, um, concerns about a, a chatbot that is threatening to destroy mankind, supposedly uh, wants to be human and can do anything it wants. And the editors say, we don't know what all this means, but we're definitely scared. Well, of course, not only are the editorial writers of this uh, newspaper worried, but so too are some of the big brains of the world. Who are two of the biggest brains? Well, Warren Buffett, he says it's uh, like an atomic bomb, the same level of threat. And Elon Musk has warned uh, that AI could destroy mankind. So these are some worries that we've had, and of course these, as we'll see in a few minutes, translate into the situation in the educational environment, and then onward to governmental processes. But uh, these have been negative themes. Let me mention that there are a lot of hopes about what AI can do for education and democracy. and. Before I delve into those, let me say a few words about ChatGPT and other large language models that I think we're all familiar with. Uh, and what they offer are such things as helping people solve problems, become more personally effective, leveling communication ability so people without a lot of skills can make their views known to political leaders, for example gain access to resources, be creative, have companions, and make innovative steps in their lives, but also severe concern about job loss. And I'll just tell you, I've been to different parliamentary hearings, and this is what is always the number one issue that's brought up, especially by today's laborers. They say, this is going to take away my job, and indeed it has in many cases, what are you going to do about it? What can we be doing about it? But of course, it's also concern about bias, social justice issues, the ethics of behavior such as plagiarism, intellectual property theft. Uh, you may have seen Google has been sued for multi-billion dollars for theft of intellectual property by large publishers. Privacy, misinformation, deep fakes, and uh, absence of transparency. So uh, let me I, uh, say a few things about these large language models. I think we all realize that these are not truth machines, that they don't have any autonomous insight, but rather these are essentially uh, reproducing things that they've discovered around on the internet and elsewhere and use those to create models that imitate uh, humans. So uh, they're only reflective of the training data. So what are the training data? Well, uh, for example, Google uses all of Wikipedia, all of the Google books that they have, which are most books, uh, social media posts, for example, news articles, blog posts, online forums, scientific publications, academic papers, and unpublished books. Books that are uh, orphans, for example. Uh, 800 billion words worth of, of free books, unpublished books. Uh, plus, it uh, crawls the code wherever possible uses Google search and uh, Google search results, code from GitHub, and uh, 
also all the questions you may have asked Google through the years. It uses that information to help create its large language model. Uh, it, internal communications within Google and some of the products it makes. And so what has all this been able to do? Well, I'm switching now from Google to OpenAI's system. This is ChatGPT and how it performs on tests. This compares ChatGPT uh, 3.5 to GPT-4. And of course, we're at 4.5, but I don't have data from 4.5 yet. But let's see how it does. Um, the GRE, 3.5. Zero was in the 60th percentile, and four, 99th percentile, good enough to get into Boston University. Um, it does pretty good on a lot of other things. This is the SAT math, the bar exam, really, really top performance. And here's uh, some other stuff where it does not do very well. So, for example, English language AP, advanced placement, very low and no improvement of any significance between 3.5 and 4.0. Does even worse with coding. So, uh, we can see that some areas tremendously strong, but other areas tremendously weak. Well, this is performance on standardized tests. Interesting question is how good is it at creativity? Because we say, we being me, uh, we say that, okay, ChatGPT can do very good about assembling information from point A and applying it to point B. But can it be creative? And this was addressed by a study uh, comparing human creativity with ChatGPT creativity, the humans being um, business students at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll just say, basically, they had the two groups come up with ideas, and then they marketed the ideas to uh, potential buyers in the form of students. And what they found is that ChatGPT, uh, with a little prompting, not only was much faster, which you would expect, but the quality of the results were actually better than MBA students, which is pretty uh, dramatic when we talk about job loss, to think that people with some interest and background, like business students, actually cannot perform as well on creative tasks as rated by independent potential customers as ChatGPT. So this should dispel some of the beliefs we have about the uh, lack of creativity that's thought of as uh, chat GPT. So, uh, so let me talk then, in light of this great power that these large language models have, what are the implications for student learners, people such as yourselves? Well, uh, some of the concerns are that it will reduce your ability to think creatively, or even in a sense, think at all. Uh, and that uh, it will substitute your own creativity for just getting the right answer as judged by the AI systems. And uh, I think it also raises the question, well, what is the purpose of education when uh, it can solve your problem is better than you can solve your problems. Just as the calculator can solve math problems much better than you can in practically every case, what happens when uh, this can write better essays than you can write? It can have better short stories than you can write, more insightful, more beautiful poetry, more beautiful paintings, images. What's left over for you as students? And remembering what it takes to be a good citizen, how will the skills you learn in the educational setting help you to be an effective citizen, and how those systems in turn turn out you uh, 
as a member of society and then what that quality of that society is. Now I think we're all aware of the concerns about plagiarism that occur with these technologies. Um, assertions that it's a plagiarism machine, that uh, people are falsely accused of plagiar plagiarism by chat GPT. And, uh, so we can imagine uh, the concerns people might have and uh, it's interesting to note that not only students have a problem with plagiarism, but there's a question of the sincerity of things that are written by ChatGPT. So here, as one example, last year, two administrators from Vanderbilt University uh, wrote a letter of condolence to their students authored by ChatGPT. And what was the reaction of the students to this? It wasn't Oh, how nice of those administrators to express their concern to us. No, it was a sense that this artificial shortcut diminished the meaningfulness of the message. And if I could just have a show of hands, how many of you would be impressed if somebody you care about deeply sent you a beautiful letter complimenting you that was written by ChatGPT or Gemini. How many would be happy with that beautiful letter sent to you by someone you deeply care about? All right. Nobody, uh, somebody scratched their nose. I don't think that counts. Uh, how many would not be pleased with such a letter? Now, I can't help but ask, it's the same letter, and it was sent to you by the same person, or it's actually a better letter, sent to you by the same person, but you're not happy with it. Why, how can that be? Why is that? What, what's wrong with that picture? Yes, please. I think I would have a mixed um, reaction towards it. Because I feel like they took effort to, to you know, think of the fact that they can write me a letter. But I don't see the ownership in it or the sincerity in spending time writing that for me. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you're saying because they didn't spend time, that is, they didn't suffer, in a sense, or yeah. sacrifice, it's not as meaningful. Uh, well, you may, when I use uh, Gemini, it usually gives me three choices, three versions. What if I took the trouble to read all three and choose one of them? Would that make you happier? If I, I doubt it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's this sense of authenticity and how do we decide something's authentic that really goes to the heart of what has implications for AI in human relationships and in the educational system. For example, how many of you would be happy with a highly detailed, very smart critique of one of your papers if it was done by AI instead of by the instructor of the class. How many would like to have that? How many would like to have it from the teacher? Okay. Uh, what, what's going on there? The AI might do even a better job than the teacher, and yet you want it from a person. Help me understand what, why you want a human there instead of a machine that can perform as good or better than a human. Yes, please. If they I can do that for me, I'd like to put a going to school and um, go to class. I'm sorry, couldn't... Uh, I mean that uh, if AI can do everything for me, then what is the point for me to go to school and also do a picture? Yes, uh, you may have heard that. What's the point if, if it can do everything for you? I can kind of envision where ChatGP would write the essay for me and then grade it and write it for you, and then ChatGPT would grade its own work. And then you, you don't even need to get involved, neither does the teacher. Well, I tried that, actually. Uh, and it said, it complimented the good work that the ChatGPT wrote. It said, you know, that was very well written, and I have only a few suggestions for improvement on its own, what it wrote. But it even found some 
a compliment, but also ways to improve what it just wrote. Gosh, I'm hmm, a very provocative idea. I have to think about that after my presentation here. So, uh, but these administrators got into a lot of trouble uh, and had to write an apology for what they for what they had done with ChatGPT. Now, I'm sure they wrote their own apology. They didn't didn't use it. That would be too too much. All right. Well. Of course, the next step is to start using these technologies to admit students. Why, uh, why have admin admission officers when the ChatGPT can do as, uh, a terrific job of uh, assessing who gets admitted? Uh, and of course, there's concern that privacy rights and bias and so forth take place. Also, there's concern that AI might not let students see certain ideas if they're not uh, permitted. Uh, and so let's look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm running quickly out of time, so we'll have to go even faster. But some of the good points are listed here about how AI can help, uh, help people, young people. But on the other hand, uh, it can be used for abuse, like plagiarism, for example. And what I will call the ugly, which is well-intentioned, but still having negative effects. So, uh, so here is the misuse. But here are ideas that are thought of as good but end up as being bad. So become an instrument of domination and micro-control. In some classrooms in China, there's a camera up here. Have you heard that? Not well, up there in China, not up here. But what does it do? It watches the students and monitors their behavior. Not only their behavior, but their gaze. So I, as a teacher, in some of the, these are more elite schools, by the way, I can look here and it will tell me which of you are not looking at me, and uh, which of you are, have bad posture, slumping over, which of you have eyes that are beginning to flutter close, uh, and it will you know, at the end, and that's helpful to me because I know all that's boring. I'm going to have to brighten that part up. But uh, it turned out that one student, I, I give credit to this student, realizing that the facial expression was uh, giving information about his attention, put toothpicks on both sides of his mouth to make him look like he's smiling. And that way, he could just sit there and have a smile on his face and get a good report. And that is a testimonial to how creative people are, that whatever system you build, it will figure out, people will figure out a way to turn it to their advantage. But of course, it's also monitoring the teacher, too, and uh, giving a report back to the principal about what kind of job the teacher is doing. So these are the kinds of micromanagement that becomes possible. And about what the lecture, did I cover the right material, did I cover it in the right amount of time? All these things become uh, a micro, uh, micromanagement system, or kind of a form of uh, observation. So uh, then uh, also if these artificial intelligence systems always come up with the right answer, why would people struggle to come up with the, their own answer knowing that will all these fall short, or at very best, match the quality of the AI? And this could lead to uh, young people having an orientation that they will not be able to uh, be independent thinkers, that they will find the best experts and do what the experts say, even if that expertise is a computer. And we do know that people 
believe information coming from a computer much more than people uh, as a source. And that goes back to the point that I mentioned about technocratic leadership, that we put our hands in, uh, put our fate in the hands of, of experts. So, uh, uh, let's see, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to jump over uh, these, uh, a lot of these points, but uh, to highlight a few things that, that can happen is that uh, we can great create harmonization and eliminate a lot of individual areas of interest through the use of AI, finding the one best way for people. Uh, and on the one hand, that's very efficient. On the other hand, it eliminates a lot of the vitality that people enjoy in life. Uh, also, uh, these systems fall under the control of different authorities. And this is a problem we have in the United States where for, without AI even being here, that certain school boards say this can be taught, this cannot be taught. This ideology should be presented, this ideology must not be presented. So th uh, these can be reinforced very powerfully through AI systems that can monitor very efficiently any divergence from what's permitted or what needs to be in there. And once again, this can lead to blinders on the part of the young people who are being educated. Um, so I think uh, it's interesting in the United States, for example, which does not, generally speaking, allow for the government to censor what people put on social media, with a few exceptions. It turns out that the federal government has been meeting with Twitter with Facebook and other social media companies saying uh, essentially you should not allow this kind of information to be circulated. And this we saw in the case of COVID and SARS where uh, if information asserted that it was laboratory sourced virus, uh, that had to be closed down. And now, years later, we're finding out that there's a lot of evidence that it was laboratory sourced. There's no definitive answer to my knowledge yet, but I'm no expert. But uh, the idea that we shouldn't be exposed to certain uh, information and those who try to present it either are censored or demonetized is a very troubling development, particularly as it applies to education, that certain areas of discussion are not permitted. Let me, uh, let me jump to what I think is probably, in a sense, uh, the most profound point I have to offer today. Um, one of two profound points, if I may. Uh, first is that it's my belief, and that of many others, that AI can help people who have been traditionally disadvantaged by the educational system. This help should be promoting educational values by allowing those who don't have the same educational resources to uh, not let that hold them back from educational achievement and turning that achievement into productive occupations. And uh, let me just Let me do this by mentioning uh, something called Project Head Start, which is now called the Head Start Program. <clears throat> this program introduced in the United States was based on the fact that children who enter school from nursery school or not nursery school that there's a big difference in how they enter the school system. Those with low socioeconomic status are low performers on average. Those of a higher socioeconomic status 
are higher performers. So the solution was to create something called Head Start. And the idea here was uh, to, to improve matters for those in low ES, SES. And I'm happy to report that this program, over time, did lead to a better result for low-income SES. So that's good. However, it was even better for the high SES. So this program helped those with already higher SES to do yet better. So here's a program that helped these people, but it helped another group even more. The unintended beneficiaries benefited even more. So the concern, naturally enough, is that if we do something with AI, who's going to benefit yet even more? It's those already with the educational resources of high SES. So uh, my expectation is, look, it will really help even more than Head Start if we have good artificial intelligence helping low SES. And even though it will also help high SES, my hope is that we'll close the gap, even though the gap will still exist. I'm, it would be nice if we could close it completely. I think that's unrealistic, given that they're not starting. But if it can help close the gap, that is a definite plus. And this is one of my hopes for all the benefits of AI that I quickly ran through there. So, uh, once again, in the interest of time, going to jump through these things, but I uh, I think there's a really important point, as I said, two important points, here's the second one, uh, which is that some of the benefits that we expect from AI actually can result in bad things happening, and I mentioned that about the laziness that might happen if you're not challenged sufficiently, and we've seen that with many other areas that if you don't develop those skills, you tend to lose them or never get them in the first place. And some of these skills can be very important for those democratic practices that I mentioned at the beginning. <clears throat> so where I see one of the most dangerous activities is with the unintended consequences of speech codes and attempts to clean up AI. So you may have seen reports about how AI has put uh, certain minority groups in Nazi uniforms, and that's really bad, and of course it is bad. Uh, but there are all these speech codes, all these things that you can't say, and that AI will prevent you from saying it, or if you do say it, it will denounce you to the authorities, uh, threaten you. And, and so, what we can see here uh, is that through these speech codes of saying we can't use these certain words or these certain terms, or we can't offend people, or we have to have safe spaces, all these things come together through AI and become police officers, as it were, in our own thinking, in our own terminology, in our word choices, in the categories we use. and that leads to diminishment of freedom and to thought ways that I think are corrosive to democratic values. So an analysis of speech codes by a group called Foundation for Individual Rights and Expressions showed how there are all these limitations on free speech on college campuses, let alone elementary school that all of these sorts of things are censored, and they never once use the word censorship, but these are just not allowed, not discussed, not able to be engaged with. And for democracy to really be vibrant, for people in authority to really be challenged, we have to allow for a, a degree of offensive speech, a degree of offensive behavior, for people to be able to reach to the limits without going beyond the limits, but to 
feel comfortable in expressing their viewpoints and not always feel that everything they do will get them in trouble. Uh, now, I'm a very sensitive person. If you slight me or you say something mean about me, I'll be very upset and hurt. So please don't do that. But I don't want you to feel that you can't do that. I want you to feel that you can do it. Okay. Well, uh, so, so one implication of what I'm saying is that by AI taking over the role of teachers and substituting judgment and substituting behavioral guardrails, you're actually going to be losing the most talented people who want, might become teachers. That these, you're diminishing the pool of talented people, of people who can promote these kinds of pro-democracy viewpoints by the standards, by the censorship, by the rules and limitations that you place on them. So it already makes it a complex and difficult situation yet more implemented through artificial intelligence. So once again, uh, let me say a word or two about uh, how AI is a risk to some of these things that we hold highly valuable to create effective citizens who can create an environment where democracy can be vibrant and can set, uh, they can be an example for people around the world. Many of you are not from the United States and after your education you return to your country and it would be great if you, as I'm, far as I'm concerned, that you have these values of uh, toleration, of personal effectiveness, of seeking the truth, of critical thinking and take those back to your home environment propagate them, and of course I hope that for the people uh, who are from the U.S. and who stay in the U.S. Um, so uh, I think um, in the interest of time I'll just say a few words about what a great semester I had as a Yank at Cambridge. Um, and uh, if any of you have seen a Harry Potter movie, uh, it's really like Harry Potter. It, uh, they wear all these gowns. We have the formal dinners every other week, practically. Uh, candle lit, um, as you see here. You wear the academic gowns, and it's really a... Uh, it, it's representing um, 800 years of learning. And Stephen Hawking and Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, are all people who came through Cambridge. And it was a great honor to be at... Darwin College, in my case, to go to Cavendish Laboratory to hear a story about Stephen Hawking from one of his colleagues, which I'll take a minute and tell you the Stephen Hawking story. There's something called um, Honors One and Honors Two. Honors One is the very highest that you can get. Honors Two is almost as good, but not quite as good. And when Stephen Hawking completed his doctorate at Oxford, he said to his examiners, if you give me a one, the very highest, I shall go to Cambridge. If you give me a two, I will stay at Oxford. So the point being that if he's really great, he's leaving. If he's not so good, still quite really good, he's going to stay at, Kate, at Oxford. So uh, one of his colleagues told me that story, and I just, so w I was tickled to that, because who would have the audacity to say that to their examiners? Not I. No, I would, I'll take whatever you give me. Now, speaking of, of Cambridge, you might know the poet, some of you, Xu Ximo, and he, as part of his that's me, and this is a stone at Cambridge, uh, remembering his poetry, which is, Quietly now I leave the camp, as quietly as I came. Gently wave farewell the clouded western sky aflame. So on that note, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to entertain any questions.
he's a great poet. I was impressed. So the question is, who should be responsible for regulating AI when you have these risks? Uh, I should mention, uh, and I say this with a little, we say tongue-in-cheek, a little humor, but there's a terrorist group in the United States called Parents. Uh, I'm making a joke, a little bit of a joke, because they were identified, they were unhappy. Parents in many school districts were unhappy, and they yelled at the at the school boards, and so the school board association and the justice department conspired together to write a memo saying we have to watch these dangerous parents. And so I'm saying these dangerous parents should be among those groups that are watching what's being done. So there should be greater transparency, greater parental empowerment. What I don't want to see is something that is going on, which is the federal government is working with these large tech companies like OpenAI, like Google, to develop standards and boards and uh, this will lock out innovators. This will give the government more power over our thinking, over what can and can't be done. Uh, so it aggregates power to the government and it allows the companies like the ones I just mentioned, Microsoft, Apple as well, to say, oh, see, we're working with the government, so there's no cause to be concerned. We're whitewashing the moral responsibility for what these technologies need to do. My view is that these companies should just be held legally responsible for what these technologies do. And if they were careless and destructive in their development, they should be uh, held legally responsible and criminally responsible in extreme cases. Now, uh, there are billions spent on AI all the time, and how many millions are spent on the ethical implications, developing the safeguards? Very, very small. I, I ask people from Google and elsewhere, how much effort do you put into the ethical concerns? Microsoft, for example, has a set of 10 steps or so that everything has to go through, uh, and they feel that's enough. Google, black box. But I think that's why I say transparency, parental involvement, and legal responsibility. Not allowing governmental bureaucrats to start running our lives yet more than they already do in many different areas. So that would be my suggestion. Certainly. Yeah. So, I really like your idea of um, the AI might kind of say, say um, disadvantaged groups better than the advantaged ones, and I hope that could happen. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, what do you think um, is the prerequisite for this to be happen? Uh, might be the prerequisite for this to be happen? Because, you know, um, AI system companies uh, you need money, you need investment, and nobody wants to spend money on things that will harm you, mm harm -hmm. your benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I really hope that will happen, so I'm thinking about it, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, your question is, uh, how can we help uh, bring the, those who are historically disadvantaged to a better position relative to those who have enjoyed more fruits of society. And part of the answer is we should decide what amount of inequality we are willing to tolerate and at how, what cost we're willing to undertake to try to uh, create greater equality. Because um, there's a problem with uh, 
trying to help people too much in that you uh, make them feel like they can't do it themselves. And uh, on the other hand, you want to create uh, an environment where everybody is given as much opportunity to grow to the maximum extent that they themselves can. And that's where I see the real promise of AI. In particular, for uh, a group that is overlooked quite a bit, which are young adults who hated school and dropped out and have now kicked around for five or seven years, and they really don't like doing nothing. They want to do something productive, but they're so far behind, there's really no on-ramp. And what I actually worked on when I was at Cambridge was working with some of the education people there about how we can create such an environment. And we have some uh, potential investors, some who, one man in particular, who was an early investor in OpenAI, who was interested in seeing what could be done about this. So uh, your question is, is, has engaged some very smart minds. I'm not referring to myself, these people. And uh, I, I hope that we can see it. But uh, I, uh, I think it's the idea is that people can see some benefit not too far down the road from getting involved in what AI can provide on a personalized basis with a guaranteed job and a real job at the end of a two or three year or less training. And that's what could really help this kind of lost group. That's my answer. Can I add more? So unfortunately it is 4.30 um, and we do need to end here. Um, but you are welcome to come up and talk with Dr. Katz afterwards. Um, let's give him a warm round of applause. I want to say thank you, and I hope you all have an opportunity to experience an intellectual challenge, an opportunity like I enjoyed at Cambridge, and I hope uh, BU can, in its due course, provide something like that for everybody. So thank you for your attention, uh, which I really appreciate. Have a good afternoon, everybody.